The Bitcoin Standard Podcast brings you seminars from Saifedean.com, my independent online learning platform where you can take my online courses on the economics of Bitcoin and economics in the Austrian school tradition, join our two live weekly seminars, and read my books before they are published. Sign up now for access to the draft of my forthcoming economics textbook, Principles of Economics, and take five full online courses based on my books, The Bitcoin Standard, The Fiat Standard, and Principles of Economics. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to the show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. CrowdHealth is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. CrowdHealth holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for CrowdHealth and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coiner friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning every day's pair change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Get paid in Bitcoin regardless of who you work for and regardless of who is paying you. All thanks to a premium service I personally love and use, and that is Bitwage. Thanks to Bitwage, I receive my books royalties in Bitcoin. It is cheaper, faster, and easier. It is a true set it and forget it system, and Bitwage has been offering this premium service since 2014. Anyone can sign up and use it right away. No restrictions or limits, fully non-custodial. You can even split your incoming payment, get part in Bitcoin and part to a bank account you specify. It could not be easier and I cannot recommend Bitwage highly enough. Go to bitwage.com and sign up now and get paid in Bitcoin with your next payment or salary. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Professor Gail Pooley, who is an Associate Professor of Business Management at Brigham Young University in Hawaii. Professor Pooley has taught economics and statistics in many countries around the world. Oh, no, wait, it's just uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia and Brigham Young. That's, I'll, I'll just skip that. I'll just, uh, sorry, I, I went with your bio online, uh, but Ma Max will fix this. Dr. Pooley earned his BA in economics at Boise State University. He did graduate work at Montana State University and completed his PhD at the University of Idaho. His dissertation topic was on the knowledge acquisition preferences of the CEO of the Inc. 500. Professor Pooley recently published a very interesting book called Superabundance, and we are here to discuss this book, which I found enormously fascinating. And his work has been hugely influential on my next book, Principles of Economics, we both share a huge uh, respect and admiration of uh, Julian Simon, one of my favorite economists, and I presume, obviously, one of Dr. Pooley's favorite economists. And Dr. Pooley has taken Julian Simon's work to heart and developed a fascinating index based on this, which I think is enormously important, and the lessons from it 
are really, really significant for the world. And it's something that I discuss at length in my next book. And I'm very delighted to have Professor Puli here to talk to us about it today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Great to be here. I see you've got a copy of the Bitcoin Standard behind you. So thank you for yes, that. Yes, indeed. <laughs> it's it's the you... uh, number one recommended book for my students in money and banking. It's like, you got to read this book to understand money and what it's about. So, you know, it's about Bitcoin, but it's really about money. So uh, you, you did such a great job writing on that topic. So thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So let's begin a little bit with a personal background. Uh, what got you into economics and what got you into Julian Simon's work and then eventually led to you publishing um, Superabundance? You know, I just, uh, I had to take an econ class uh, as an accounting major, and I just uh, kind of fell in love with econ. Uh, you know, accounting was very interesting, but economics was very inspiring. I just felt like if you could learn these principles, you would be able to see the future before anybody else did. So it was it was very interesting to me. Uh, ended up doing a, a bachelor's in econ and then went on to Montana State, and that was actually where I met Julian Simon. He came to uh, our campus and gave a little little interview, uh, a little seminar. And at that time, it was 1981. So he just made this bet with um, with Paul Ehrlich. So we were all interested about this. And and uh, if you recall, uh, let me throw a couple slides up here, and I'll kind of show you what uh, you know the, the story was about. So. Uh, Ehrlich had written this book, Simon said, you know, when we first read the book, and he says, yeah, that, that book sounds like it makes sense, but uh, maybe I should check the, the facts against it, see what the, the history said. And he, he concluded, look, uh, there's some problems here. I, I don't think this is actually going to happen. So they go back and forth and have this, they have this pretty public dispute about what the future is going to hold, this relationship between resources and population. It was really kind of based on this uh, theory that Thomas Malthus had put on the table back in 1798 that said, uh, look, uh, over time, food's going to grow at a linear rate, but population's going to grow at an exponential rate. This gap is ultimately going to cause society to collapse. So uh, Simon reads this book and says, you know, I think the facts suggest something different. And they go back and forth. And finally, Simon says, well, why don't we bet? You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, the beauty of being a professor is you can say whatever you want to and never really have to be held accountable for it. Right. But uh, Simon put Simon put Ehrlich on the table and said, let's put a thousand bucks on the table. You pick any kind of non-renewable commodity, whatever, and and we'll bet. And so uh, Ehrlich picked five metals, copper, chromium, nickel, tin, and tungsten, and they put $1,000 on the table. The bet starts in 1980, concludes in 1990, so it's this 10-year bet. The idea was if it, whatever percent it goes up, adjusted for inflation, if it goes up, Ehrlich, uh, if it goes up, Simon, you got to pay Ehrlich the difference. If it goes down, Ehrlich has to pay Simon. So they both kind of had this uh, theory about this relationship between resources and population. Uh, Ehrlich said, look, as population increases, resources are going to become less and less abundant. Uh, they're gonna, we're going to run out. The price is going to go up, and we're going to have this huge problem. Simon said, yeah, there is a relationship between the two, but this is what it looks like. As population increased, uh, these resources became more and more abundant. The price actually had gone down further and further. So they have this bet, and over the course of 10 years, we're all watching this bet, you know, watching these prices go up and down. And at the conclusion of the bet, uh, you know, here's one of the uh, the most important, one of the most important checks ever written in economics, in my view. Uh, this, this, this check that Paul had to write Julian for $576. Now, adjusted for inflation, that was a 36% drop in the prices of those five commodities. Some of them dropped more than that. And this happened during the decade when we added 850 million people to the planet. So how was it that we could add so many people at the same time have these prices drop? So that was really kind of, you know, I've always been interested in that. Always had this interest in, in Julian and his work. And here a, a couple of years ago, you know, I'm, I'm reading this paper that Marion Tupi had written, this uh, guy at the... Cato Institute, and he had kind of did this uh, little update to the Simon uh, bet. And so I reached out to him and said, hey, why don't we uh, do something together? Let's let's look at these prices. 
let's expand this to 50 commodities. Uh, you know, one of the two of the critiques of the Simon Ehrlich bet was one, it was only for 10 years, and two, it was only five commodities. So we said, well, let's stretch it out for 38 years and uh, go to 50 commodities and see what happens. So we have energy, we have food, we had materials, uh, we had metals, and then we had these uh, uh, other materials. And uh, so what we discovered, uh, went back to 1980, World Bank keeps track of all the nominal prices uh, of these commodities. They actually do a monthly report of these commodities. So we had a really good data set of, of data. But the other thing that we did is we use time prices. Now, time prices are, and recall, we buy things with money, but we really pay for them with time. And so we decided to use time prices. And a time price is pretty, really pretty easy to calculate. Let me show you how we do a time price. So a time price is simply, um, so time price, uh, money prices are expressed in dollars and cents, but time prices are expressed in hours and minutes. And it's pretty easy to convert a time price or a money price to a time price. We just take the time, uh, we take the money price and divide it by hourly income. So that will express things in dollars and cents. And what that allowed us to do then is to, time prices offer really five advantages over money prices. Our, our friend George Gilder uh, offers these three propositions. He says, wealth is knowledge, growth is learning, and money is time. And from those three propositions, we can derive this theorem that you can measure the growth in knowledge with time. And the way we do it is with these is with time prices. So <clears throat> we take these time prices and we uh, we convert all of these prices, money prices to time prices. And then we look at the change in the time price over time. In other words, how much time did it take you to earn you know, a pound of sugar? last year and how much time does it take you to earn a pound of sugar today if the time price is going up or down that's reflecting more or less abundance so we go out and we start doing this analysis and we just uh, we started with these 50 basic commodities and what we found when we first first year we did it we, we've done it for for four years now the first year we did it we found that the uh, time price on the average of these 50 uh, basic commodities had fallen by, those are the commodities. So we had energy, uh, oil, natural gas, coal. We had food. So we had coffee, tea, peanuts, wheat, barley, uh, corn, uh, bananas. We had materials like lumber and cotton and wool and hides, uh, rubber, aluminum. We had all these metals. So what we found is that over this uh, period of time, these time prices from 1980 to 2018 had fallen by 71%. And it was like, wow, wow. What that means is for the time it takes you to buy one of these in 1980, you get almost three and a half of them in 2018. So your personal abundance had actually increased by 252%. And so we were really surprised with this. Recall at the same time, we compared that to population and population over this 38 year period had increased by 71%. So it's like, that's interesting. Every time population goes up by a percent, uh, these commodities become, the price falls by 1%. What explains that? And that's where we go back to Julian Simon. And he says, well, the explanation is straightforward. Innovation is what we really, what allows us to escape poverty and innovation is a consequence of human beings having ideas and then having the freedom to act on these ideas. And those ideas become inventions. And then these inventions go to the market and the market decides whether they've created value or not. And he said, look, if you want more innovation, you gotta be in favor of more ideas and human beings are the source of those ideas. So his theory said, as you have more population, you're gonna have more ideas and that's what's actually going to make these things more abundant. He also makes this distinction between, uh, in, in our, our friend Thanos, <laughs> in Infinity War, he's, he makes this statement about the universe is finite and its resources is finite. Well, it's half true. The universe, the earth is a, has a finite number of atoms, but resources are not finite because resources are really uh, a function of knowledge. It's knowledge. The difference between our 
day in the Stone Age, as George Gilder says, is entirely due to the growth in, of knowledge. We're growing knowledge, and that's what makes atoms valuable, is when you add knowledge to them. And we don't we have a finite number of atoms, but creativity does not appear to be finite. So uh, that's where we started. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's an extremely important point, which I would say more than 99% of people will disagree with. I mean, it's just completely unthinkable for them. Everybody takes the Malthusian insight as being obvious. You know, Malthus is just a great economist who clearly um, uh, at the right time, you know, at the moment that we were beginning to get into industrialization, at the moment when we were beginning to really abuse and consume our Earth's uh, resources, he identified what that problem was. And it's this, uh, you know, it's this apocalypse that's always around the corner. And, and, and there's nothing that can um, dispel that fear from people's minds. Like he, he clearly showed us that people will just breed like rabbits. And so more and more people will uh, come into Earth. And, you know, the Earth's uh, crust has a limited amount of everything. And so eventually we're going to hit those limits. And it's only a matter of time before we hit those limits. And it's just extremely difficult to communicate to people the idea that, no, actually there are no limits. And of course, it sounds insane at the beginning. Like, you know, the earth is finite. Uh, there's no um, there's no backup earth. We can start uh, just uh, mining quickly. And of course, some people get into ridiculous sci-fi about, you know, we need to... Um, <laughs> go and build rockets that go to travel to other planets to get zinc and nickel from other planets because otherwise we'd run out from here. But really, I think the Malthusian view is just uh, built on the idea that the Earth is limited, but it has a very, very uh, wrong conception of just the size of Earth. I think the real issue here is that Earth is far, far, far larger than we can imagine. It's so huge. It's so enormous that it doesn't really matter how much of a particular metal is in Earth because we could spend an eternity digging and looking for it and we, we still would find more and more. But that limit is completely inconsequential because we're going to run into the real scarcity before we run into the scarcity of the material on Earth, we're going to run into the real scarcity, which is our time, which is the opportunity exactly. cost. So yeah. it's 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 practically irrelevant how much zinc or copper or oil or gold or silver exists in Earth, because that's by no means a, a limit on how much we can have. The limit on how much we can have of all of those things is how much we want to sacrifice of all the other things. We can right. get more copper if we want to, it's just that digging for more copper means that we're going to have to give up on other stuff. We're going to have to give up on manufacturing cars so that we can dedicate uh, workers and machinery away from car manufacture to copper uh, exploration. And I think the really powerful thing that Julian Simon did in his book, The Ultimate Resource, and as well in your book, Superabundance, which I also try and communicate in the Bitcoin standard, and I elaborate more on in the principles of economics, is to try and move people from this idea that we are just, uh, th there's a there's a bucket and we are finishing it up, we're drinking out of it and we're finishing the water in this limited bucket, to the understanding of, look, there's an enormous ocean of water there and there's no possibility that you're going to finish it. The limit on how much you can get from it is how much you go and get from it. It's, it's the economic right. idea that there is an opportunity cost involved in getting it, right? Right. So here, here's a little story. I, uh, you know, a little quiz I love to give to my to my students is how many keys are in a piano? And it's like, well, there's 88 keys. Well, then how many songs are in a piano? And it's kind of a trick question because the songs really aren't in the piano. The sign, songs are in in the minds of human beings, and that that number is infinite. So you can take a fixed number of a fixed number of keys and create infinite atoms. Where we made this mistake in economics early on is we tried to be physics. We tried to think about atoms, counting atoms with money. And the argument we make is we got to move beyond atoms and money to, to knowledge and time. It's knowledge that creates value, uh, not atoms. When you add knowledge to atoms, that's what moves them into this valuable uh, resource category. It's knowledge. And 
and we think about this all the time around us. It's it's like, well, well, how do we create new knowledge? Uh, think about buying a, a a new Bugatti, and it's a million dollars, and you're driving it down the road, and you crash it, and all the value just disappears, but the atoms are still there. It's the arrangement of those atoms that make make it valuable, and to be able to 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 move beyond this. Uh, thinking in physics, thinking in physical things, and thinking in value. It's the value of things that count. You know, if you ask Thanos or Ehrlich or Malthus, you have 88 keys on a piano, how many songs? They'd say, well, 88 keys, you must have 88 songs. I mean, we think that's ridiculous, right? Because we understand that's the creativity of the arrangement that creates the value. And that is really a function of human intelligence and ingenuity and uh you know what we're, we're able to do as human beings uh it's true that rabbits do breed but humans innovate much faster than they breed uh this idea we got this physical limit uh, physical size and each time you add a person the slice of your pizza is going to get smaller for everyone no each time you add a person it seems like the people that we add to this party bring their own pizza and not only do they share their pizza, they they create more pizza for everyone else. We see this growth in resources at a much faster slope than the growth in population. And that's what the book tries to document. First of all, we use time prices. We, we get a way to quantify it, quantify and measure abundance resource. And then we go out and start taking this framework and applying it to all kinds of different data sets. We start with this 50 basic commodities. But we also moved on and, and looked at all kinds of other things. So we go back in time. And uh, for example, uh, you know, if you think about a refrigerator, uh, for the time it took your parents to buy a refrigerator, or your, your parents in 1956 to buy a refrigerator, you get 13 today. For the time it took somebody, your great grandparents, uh, 100 years ago to buy a bicycle, you get 22 bicycles today. For the time it took your somebody in 1850 to buy one pound of sugar, you get 227 pounds today. Bad so example, we just had this, but I'll let it slide. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite example because it <laughs> illustrates how sweet life has become. I mean, it's just like there's sugar all over the place. Uh, but, but you know, everywhere we looked, we just saw this, we just see this abundance. And we don't really notice it because it just happens a little bit every day. You know, if something is growing at 3% a year compounded, it doubles every 24 years. So, you know, 24 years and it doubles. It's, it's not linear. It's like you go from one to two to four to eight every 24, and every, every 24 years if you can get on this 3% growth curve. And that's what the time prices are suggesting is we're much closer to a 3 to 4% growth curve, you know, with all this stuff. And... Uh, so it was, it was really fun to just to start applying this framework to stuff. And we get out an old Sears catalog from 1979 and, and pull it up and compare it to walmart.com today. You know, go find a blender or a toaster in, in 1980 in Sears, uh, which is kind of the Walmart of its day. We compare it to today. And it's like, well, you get like five toasters for the price of one. Yeah, and to be clear, you know, uh, here we're talking about wage uh, prices and time prices. We're not talking about the uh, prices in terms of dollars. So obviously, the price of a toaster right. has likely gone. Well, I mean, it depends on uh, some things have gotten cheaper, some things have gotten more expensive. But for most things, the the nominal price has gone up in dollars. But that's and and that's why, right. the, in my mind, that's driving a lot of the uh, scarcity mentality because people see prices go up and they think things are getting um, scarcer. But in reality, reality it's just your dollars are getting more and more abundant if you measure the price of the toaster in terms of the hours of work that you need to put in in order to get a toaster that's where you see that the price has gone down right right you because time prices really contain more information because on the on the numerator you have the money price but on the time on the denominator you have the hourly income so as long as your hourly income is increasing faster than the money price the time price is going down and that's the key, the key thing to think about is it's, you know, inflation numbers just tell you how, how expensive things have gotten relative to other things. They don't, it doesn't tell you how affordable things have gotten. And the affordability, you have to look at 
hourly income in order to to determine that affordability. So you get a completely different perspective if you think in time versus money. Yeah, and this is uh, my favorite chart from your work, and um, this is I'm uh, I'm copying it into my Principles of Economics textbook. Hope you don't mind. Uh, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's ideas. There's no scarcity of ideas. Uh, definitely, I I, thought, I didn't think you would mind. Here, this is the basic fifty commodities from 1980 to 2020. So this is 40 years. You know, this is. Pretty significant trend. This is basically my life. I've been around since then. Uh, the 40 years in which I was living, uh, well, 42 by now, but 2020, 86% decline in the real price of sugar, 86% in the price of hides, 86% in pork. And as you see, in terms of time, everything has gotten cheaper. The only things that we see that have not gotten much cheaper, they, I mean, the, the things that got the least cheap, iron ore, still is 24% cheaper. So you can get significantly more even of the commodities that had the worst performance. And most likely, you know, if you do 50, you're going to find one that happened to be um, exceptionally expensive at that point in time and, or exceptionally cheap. Uh, in 1980s because of supply issues, and now it's uh, exceptionally expensive because of supply issues. So you're likely to get these anomalies. But as you see, for the vast majority of goods, the numbers are uh, over 70% reduction. In fact, looking at it overall from 1980 to 2020, we see a 75.2% uh, reduction yeah in the price, in the time price. So an hour of work in 2020 could buy you four 0.03 times as much of the basic commodities as it could buy you in 1980. So this is this is truly astounding because it's a great measure of just how much uh, our life is getting better. So my father, when I was born, he had to work four times as hard to get any of those things as I have to work. That That's great. I mean, this is really what life is all about. So the, the, the whole point of life, my the thing that my dad has told me since I was a little child is, the only point of life is for me to give you a better life than uh, the one that I had. And, uh, you know, he's certainly done it, it, a great job you, in that. You think about that. You think about that. He was willing to to live a much lower, have a much lower standard of living, make sacrifices, you know, not consume his wealth, devote that wealth to investing and in growing, you know, uh, innovation. So you and I can have a much better life. It's like, that <laughs> if you want to talk about inequality it's it's uh, the inequality between us and our parents is phenomenal it's true and uh, most of us aren't grateful enough and we don't tell them thank you enough so dad if you're listening thanks again <laughs> <laughs> uh, the now the interesting thing is uh, i well, I, I wanted to talk more about inflation, but before inflation, I think I wanted to just, as I was writing in the uh, in Principles of Economics, and here you're looking at the draft of the book, I ran some numbers on um, looking into the, uh, uh, just how much have we dug into the earth. So let's get a sense of the magnitude of the earth, because most people don't like to think about this, because if you think about how much, how big earth is and how tiny we are, um, you'll see that basically we are essentially a tiny little zit on the face of the earth. So there's a study that I found recently which shows how much, uh, which is a satellite mapping of all the areas of uh, mines, of all the mines on earth. So how much of the surface of earth have we had uh, in terms of mine, mines? And you see all of the mines in 2017 it was estimated at around 57,277 kilometers. And that's 0.011% of the planet's surface area. So for perspective, if Earth was the size of a soccer field, which is 105 meters by 68 meters or 7,140 square meters, this is this paragraph that I'm reading right now, yeah. then the surface area of all the world's mines would be 0.8 meters squared, roughly the size of a small desk, not a big desk, small desk, 122 centimeters by 61 centimeters. Um, that one has a 0.73, so slightly larger than that desk. So think about a soccer field and then think about your small desk, not even your, most likely your desk is bigger. This is like a uh, school child's desk. And a school child's desk is all that we have, is all the surface that we have scratched on earth. And that's just in terms of the surface of earth. 
So it's only that. But then if we wanted to think about the depth of how far we've gone on Earth, um, the deepest mine in the world is uh, the 3.8 kilometers deep. And the diameter of Earth is 12,742 kilometers. So we've literally barely scratched the surface. So we've only gone into about 0.027% of the diameter of Earth. So for perspective, if the Earth was a ball with a diameter of one meter, if you could replace the ball, uh, the Earth with a ball that is one meter uh, in diameter, the deepest hole ever dug by humans would be 0.027 centimeters which is less than the thickness of three pages of this book, if you measure the thickness of a page. So think about a one meter ball that's you know probably somewhere through your chest. Um, and that imagine three pages. This is the deepest hole that we've ever dug. So in terms of surface area, it's one desk out of a soccer field. In terms of depth, it's three pages out of a one meter ball. And then in terms of volume, now, how deep are the mines? Uh, data suggests that the deepest, that the average depth of a mine is 300 meters in depth. But I gave an average depth of one kilometer. Now, I mean, that, that's, I think, is uh, likely more than double the uh, average because most mines are just not that deep. That one mine in South Africa is an exception being 3.8 kilometers. But let's say on average, the mines have gone to one kilometer in depth. So then you measure the volume of Earth and you measure the volume of all of those mines. So assuming that they are the 57,000 squared kilometers of area and one kilometer uh, depth, so that's 57,277 kilometer cubed of volume, and you and you subtract that from the Earth's volume, which is around a trillion cubic kilometers, and you see that the volume of all the world's mines is 0.0000528% of the volume of the Earth. In other words, Earth is around 18 million times larger than all the mines that exist on Earth that we've ever dug, and from which we have extracted all of our resources. So for perspective, if the Earth's volume was that of an Olympic swimming pool, all the world's mines would be roughly the size of half a cup. Yeah. Everything that we've dug in 2017, which, you know, all of the things that you see, all of the computers and the machines and the cars and all of the resources and all of this um, unbearable strain that we are placing on Mother Earth is half a cup out of an Olympic swimming pool. If you've seen an Olympic swimming pool, it's enormous. I forget the exact measurements. Oh, actually, I think I have the exact measurements in the footnote here. Yeah, the, it's two and a half million liters. So an Olympic swimming pool is two and a half million liters. And the, uh, and the volume of all, everything, all of the mines that we've dug is 0 0.132 liters, which is around half a cup. So imagine taking out half a cup from a swimming pool. Like imagine all of humanity, all everything that we're doing, we managed to take out half a cup from an Olympic swimming pool. Now go to an Olympic uh, swimming competition when all of these athletes are out there swimming and take out half a cup from the water and see if anyone notices. <laughs> well, you know, the other thing is that what we've taken out, we haven't just used and it's it's gone. It's like a lot of these things we can recycle. We continue to use them. Aluminum, for example, aluminum can for a for a soda. I think it's like ninety nine percent of the the uh, soda cans have been recycled, and it's you know it's like the fifth or sixth generation of that aluminum that's been used for a can. So once you've extracted it, you continue to use it over and over again. So that's the other consideration. Yeah, and yeah, just it's, it's phenomenal. And we just get more efficient, which is another important point that Simon mentions, which is we just keep getting better at using those things. Every year, we're more efficient at extracting oil, at using oil, and at um, recycling it and at finding more and more uses for it. So, yeah, it goes back to this idea that, you know, if you're if you are adding bits to, to if you're adding knowledge to atoms to make them valuable, how do you encourage people to discover new knowledge? Well, you know, we've got billions of people on the planet, 
And, and we are discovering new little bits of knowledge every day. Both, both producers and consumers are both doing that. And those, that knowledge shows back up in the market in terms of higher wages and lower relative prices. So this combination of, of growing knowledge is what is really increasing this abundance. It's really this growth in knowledge that's, that's giving us this abundance. And once again, the two limiting factors on that is how many people do you have and are they free to innovate? How many yes. people do you have and are they free to innovate? And uh, you go to a place like China, it's like, oh, they got a lot of people, but they weren't really free to innovate until the till the 80s. And then what happened? You know, they do this with a little small measure of freedom. They do this. So as we grow and we continue to have people that are connected now, we got what? The eight, 8 billion people on the planet as of next week, according to the UN, and 6 billion of them have smartphones. So we're all connected. We've got access to these to these knowledge uh, data systems. So we're all connected to that. We can do search and we can talk to each other. We should all be able to now expect to be able to see people get on these learning curves because we have met this fundamental need of physiological needs that Maslow talks about. That people, you know, the, the one slide I, I like to show is if you go back to 1960 and look at uh, what people had, let me find it here a second. Go back to 1960 in India and, and look at how much time someone uh, takes to earn the money to buy their daily rice. And it was, it was about eight hours. Uh, you know, GDP in India in 1960 was like $85 a year. So Indians spending all their time to earn the money to grow, uh, earn earn the money to buy their rice. Same thing in China. China's GDP back then was like eighty nine dollars. In the U.S., it was three thousand dollars. So it's much higher. So you only spent like an hour, an hour in the U.S. to be able to earn your daily food. Well, what's happened since nineteen sixty? Well, India, because of the time price of rice and wheat, has fallen so dramatically. Now it takes them about an hour and a half. China, it takes them about 18 minutes. U.S. also saw an experience, uh, you know, saw this drop. But look at the time compression that's occurred there. The time inequality now is much smaller, but but larger than that. What did you give guys in India and China? You gave uh, India, and India now has six and a half hours of of time that they can devote to learning, to leisure, to uh, doing something else in China, it's almost, uh, you know, they recovered seven and three quarter hours. U.S., yeah, we got some more time, but uh, the time spread really goes from seven hour difference between the U.S. and India and China in 1960 to about an hour and 16 minutes uh, to India and only about four and a half minutes uh, in China. So we've seen this huge increase in the availability of time that people have now to jump on learning curves and discover knowledge. And we also have this great set of technologies that allow us, you got the time, you've got the technologies, you're not hungry, go discover some new knowledge and share it with the rest of us. That's that's why we, we, we think about the future. It's like, wow, there's never been a better time on this planet to be able to now pursue knowledge at these exponential rates. Yeah, and I think a very fascinating uh, paper here was one written by uh, Michael Kramer, who was an economist at uh, Chicago, I believe, who was one of the co-recipients of the Bank of Sweden Prize a couple of years ago. Usually they don't give it to very good people like Bernanke and uh, 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 Krugman, but every now and then uh, one of the good ones uh, gets gets it by mistake, I presume. Uh, but he wrote a very yeah, fascinating is they they turn bad after they get the award you know it's like they did pretty good and then they get the award and it's like then they go bad so <laughs> yeah they should have never got the award right <laughs> go ahead yeah. sorry no there's although no i think some of them have were bad all along uh krugman definitely <laughs> yeah. and bernanke yeah. so he 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 has a paper called population growth and technological change 1 million bc to 1990 and sounds outlandish, but it is actually a very interesting paper. And he uh, performs three tests of the hypothesis that it is um, essentially the Julian hypothesis. Is it uh, is an increase in human population uh, 
an impediment to advancement and economic progress, or is it not? And so uh, if the driver of economic growth was the availability of physical resources, then you would expect that periods of lower population would be able to grow faster. Whereas, because you know, if you look at a certain population, there's a small population and a bit of land. So clearly, if it's a small population, they have a lot of resources, you would expect that they would have fast growth. But um, on the other hand, if you had a large population in that same area, you would expect that the population growth would be slower, right? And then he looks at it historically, and he finds that it's not the case. In fact, as the population increases, we witness that population growth also increases. In other words, economic growth increases as the population increases. So if the driver of economic growth was technological advancement, which is his argument, then you would expect to witness the opposite. Periods of high population result in more technological discoveries and thus faster economic and population growth. This is, uh, I'm not quoting him, by the way, I'm just reading from uh, my book. So the evidence suggests the latter is the case. In other tests, in an, uh, you find that there's faster growth when the population is higher. And then in another test of the same hypothesis, Kramer compares the population density and economic growth rates across different geographic regions that were historically isolated from each other. So he looks at Australia, which is an isolated region. So, you know, he had a very big continent with very few people on it, should have led to a lot of economic growth compared to Europe, Asia, and Africa, which were all connected, but were massively populated, much more populated than Australia, much higher population density. And similarly, uh, the smaller little isolated islands, I think he uses Easter Island, and I think maybe Tasmania in Australia, because that was isolated. And he finds that, you know, these little tiny islands would have, you would expect that they would have very fast economic growth. But in fact, you find the opposite. The crowded areas have higher population growth, which again supports the idea that it is technological innovation. Because if it was physical resources, then more people are consuming more of the stuff that's in earth. Whereas if it was, uh, if it was technological innovation, then more people means more ideas. And then the really powerful idea here is that ideas are non-rival. It takes one guy to invent the wheel and then everybody sees him, everybody copies him, everybody benefits from the wheel, you know? So with all of these inventions, one person invents it and then everybody copies it and everybody benefits from it. So if the real driver of economic growth is that we can get ideas, then you would expect that a higher population, you know, if, ev if out of every 1 million people, you get one person who can invent a wheel and one person who can invent an incredibly powerful medicine and one person who can uh, do the So the more millions you have, the more wheels and the more medicines and the more inventions you have, and then everybody benefits from the wheels. Everybody benefits from the medicines. Everybody gets better off. And in fact, that's what the data shows. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a very well argued paper. And I think it's, a, it's, it's an extremely compelling addition to the uh, Simon uh, repertoire of arguments. Yeah, there's, there's two, two other things that uh, you think about there is, look, if, if you've got a million people, when you go from a million to a billion, you basically grown that population by a thousand, a factor of a thousand. So you have a thousand times more Steve Jobs a thousand times more Elon Musk. And those individuals that are able to pursue and discover this knowledge also have a much larger market to be able to uh, sell their products to. And many of these products, to be able to discover the first unit, to come up with the first recipe for this new drug, to come up for the with the first iPhone, you know, huge numbers, billions of dollars. And then the marginal cost, if it's you know heavy knowledge product, is really low. The first cost, the you know, first price to develop a new drug, say it's a billion dollars, and then the marginal cost is a dollar uh, dollar unit. Well, what should the price be? Well, it depends on the size of the market. If you've got a thousand people, then the price is going to be you know a million a million dollars per unit, uh, a million and one dollars per unit. But if you got a billion people, that drug's going to be two dollars. So being able to have a much larger market gives you the benefit of a lot more innovators and a lot more people to support these really heavy front-end development costs of these new innovation and knowledge discovery challenges. 
Yeah, absolutely. And a great example is the cell phone. In the 1980s, some people had cell phones, but it was uh, basically a suitcase and it had very, very bad battery. You know, if you're complaining about your battery right now, uh, imagine what it felt like to have to lug around the suitcase in order to make a phone call. And it was, um, it, it was extremely convenient. It was extremely expensive. It cost tens of thousands of dollars. And today, you can get a cell phone. You can get a smartphone, not just a cell phone. You know, it doesn't just perform the same functions that a yeah. 1980s suitcase uh, could perform. It's got an enormous computer that you couldn't even get in 1980, no matter who you were. You know, the thing that you're... Right basic Android phone, which you can buy for $50 today in um, some of the world's poor countries, that basic Android phone uh, can perform things that no computer could perform in 1980. I mean, no computer, right. no matter who you were, Steve Jobs in 1980, Bill Gates in 1980, they did not have a phone uh, that could do the things that um, right. uh, we today can get for 50 bucks. And it's uh, because... You know, the idea is expensive at the beginning, and then more and more geniuses keep applying their brain to this, and they keep figuring out ways of making it better. You know, who's who's invented the smartphone that we have in our pocket today? It wasn't one person. You know, um, okay, with the wheel, it might have been one person. With any particular kind of innovation, you might find the one person who made a breakthrough. But with any product that you have in your hand today, there's an infinite army of um, unknown soldiers who slaved away for hours and days and months and years in order to make tiny incre incremental improvements to the to this technology so um, it's many 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 engineers over many years who have uh, made small improvements to the cell phone so that you can get what you have in your palm today and do all of the basic capabilities that it does at this ridiculously low cost and that's not limited in any way by the amount of copper, zinc, or right. uh, uh, any kind of substance that exists on Earth. All of these things had existed 500 years ago. We didn't discover a magical new material on Earth that um, gives us free smartphones. <laughs> and we're right. under no risk of running out of this thing. There's no... Uh, you know, there's no goose that lays the uh, smartphones. And if we kill that goose, then the smartphones are gone. It's the same basic matter of Earth, the same dirt of the Earth that we've been digging into forever. But we just keep getting better at digging into it. And we just keep making more and more things. So you got you really have two things that are happening. And it illustrates this idea that producers and consumers are both adding knowledge to products iPhone comes out, Steve Jobs, you know, when he announces it, one of the things that he, he uh, said is, well, we're going to, we're also going to, you know, it's going to be a phone. It's got an iPod. You can listen to music on it. And uh, we're also going to put a browser on there, but we're going to create this platform and we're going to create some apps. Apple's going to create some apps. And one of his guys at Apple convinced him, look, Steve, why don't you open the platform and let other people uh, create apps on this thing? And so he finally decided, yeah, you know, the second iteration, he says, yeah, we're going to open it up. Now, think about all the apps that have been created for this device that Apple had no, in their wildest imagination, uh, you know, they would have never developed that app. But but these all of these developers take this platform and they see things that Apple didn't see that, that, that this device could be used for. So you got the producers that are creating the platform, you've got the consumers that are creating apps, and you get this virtuous kind of a relationship be between the, the hardware and the software that continue to create these products that really have, once again, they're heavy knowledge products. Piece of software is, is all kind of knowledge, right? And so the marginal cost approach is zero. All of us now become collaborators in the search for new knowledge that we can then share with one another. We're not competing over atoms. We're collaborating in this creation and discovery and sharing and consuming of knowledge. When you consume knowledge, you create more knowledge. It's a, it's a really interesting feature about knowledge. It's non-rivalry thing. When you consume it, you're creating it. When I share knowledge with you, the knowledge has doubled. And uh, Jordan Peterson made this really interesting observation. He said, you know, if you can do the same amount, if you can produce the same amount in half the time, you're twice as smart your knowledge has doubled. And that's what we we kind of see with time prices. We see this knowledge that just shows up everywhere from basic wheat 
to these most advanced uh, DNA sequencing machines. It's just like it's shown up everywhere because people have the time and the resources now to be able to get on these learning curves. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very powerful point. It's not just the engineers who gave us the iPhone and the modern smartphone. It's all of us, all of us as consumers, our decisions as consumers are what motivated the engineers to do what they're doing. You know, we downloaded the apps that work well, and we told the engineers behind those apps, hey, that's a great uh, feature that you added here. And we didn't download the apps that don't work well. We didn't tell our friends right. to download the bad apps. We didn't uh, pay money for the premium versions of these bad apps. And so we told the engineers behind them, no, we don't want this feature. We don't care about it. It's not useful. Um, go find something else to work with. And it's just, obviously, I mean, the, there are so many interrelated ideas here, which I try and get into in depth in my book, The Principles of Economics. Um, you know, technological advancement is one, but of course, that won't happen outside of a market system. You need to have this right. ability of feedback from the consumer to the producer, and you need to have consumer sovereignty so that the consumer is not forced to use something as they were under sort of command economies or as slaves are compelled to, to consume things. Because then, you know, if your consumer is captive, if your consumer has to consume whatever it is that you produce for them, you're just going to make a very bad product. And you see this in all monopolies. This is why all monopolies suck. You know, uh, whatever monopoly, whatever is being provided in a monopoly that doesn't face competition ends up being extremely bad for the consumer and extremely uh, profitable for the producer uh, on the long run because the producer doesn't have to are adjust. You talking about, are you talking about US dollars? <laughs> yes, I am. I am. I yeah. I've been meaning to you know. I, I've been meaning to bring this discussion to talk about inflation in particular. So I think uh, this well, is this just, is just just one more yeah one yeah. more thing that one more really good point that you make there is it's crucial that you have to remember there are two elements for innovation to work. You have to have entrepreneurs that are free to create, but you also have to have a free market where these inventions get valued where the information really rises and says that you've created something of value. I don't know if I've created something of value or not. My mother says, hey, you're a genius. You've created something of value. You have to have a market where people can then determine whether value has been created. And that market has to be free, where prices can move up and down, where you have entry of both buyers and sellers, because that part of the information equation allows us to be able to say, oh, oh, that's what I should do, or that's what I should not do. Those signals that a market provides are key to being able to guide entrepreneurs and consumers to move forward in the development of these things that are valuable. And yes. a, a, the difference between an innovation and an invention is an innovation is a valuable invention. It's the value that determines whether it's an innovation or not, not, not the technical feasibility it's the it's the value that it creates uh for for the market that determines whether it's really truly an innovation absolutely and ultimately that value is determined subjectively um because there's there's no that there's no objective way of determining what is and is not valuable but this there is a there is a subjective way which is uh, people are free to choose it and then if they like it they give up real resources that they could use elsewhere in order to get it and that's that, that that's really the eternal dance of progress depends on this. Uh, progress is just us continuing to do this. And once we stop that, we see this stop. We, uh, all through right. history, you see these examples that uh, once uh, people aren't free to innovate and choose, then everything falls apart. Right. Creation and valuation. Uh, are yes. you able to create and are you free to value things? And then, and then that signal gets sent to everybody else that we all then can can act on that new new information that the price system is giving all of us. Yeah. So yeah. So now let's shift to the topic of inflation, which I think is a very interesting underlying theme in all of this discussion. First, and I don't see this being brought up often. I don't even think that Julian Simon spoke about it. But I think, you know, it's no coincidence that uh, people like Paul Ehrlich and all of these um, uh, Malthusians became extremely popular in the 1970s. You know, Malthus died in 1840. Incidentally, oh, one more thing on Malthus. You know, when he was writing his book, the world's population was around 1 billion people. 
in 1800 and now we're up to 8 billion as you say maybe next week we're going to hit 8 billion which is a great milestone hopefully we get another 10 more before i die um so we had a world of 1 billion we already had Malthus saying we're reaching the limits and here we are 8 billion people strong and still we're not running we've never run out of anything we've never run out of any of the things that Malthus told us we would run out of and I think uh, most tellingly, to the extent that we do have uh, famines and starvation and um, economic hardship anywhere, it is man-made and, and it's not a physical limit on it. You know, you have uh, horrific political and economic systems that are putting people in very bad shape. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, not because, uh, it's not because Somalia has uh, an, a lack of uh, food resources that people in Somalia might suffer from uh, famine. It's because, you know, I mean, there's an ocean next to them with an enormous amount of fish and there's all kinds of resources that could be exploited. It's just our inability to produce because of political factors. So this, I think, continues. I mean, ironically, in a sense, uh, Malthus hit upon this right at the time when the Industrial Revolution came along and allowed human productivity to go up and allowed human uh, ingenuity to thrive. You know, the steam engine comes about and we start utilizing uh, hydrocarbon energy sources and a human productivity shoots up, you know, first with coal, then with oil, and then with gas. And we just keep, and then we develop nuclear energy and we just keep getting more and more productive and we have more and more energy at our disposal. And then the 1970s come along and, you know, as that famous website that is very popular on Bitcoin Twitter says, what the F happened in 1971? Suddenly, 1971, uh, price of everything starts shooting up and we see ourselves in this new world in which uh, everything starts to become more and more scarce. And I think the real driver of this, obviously, is inflation. It's, uh, you know, 1971, the... Um, dollar was disconnected was it was no longer redeemable in gold up, up until 1914 anybody could redeem any dollar in gold from the u.s government by 1971 only other central banks could redeem uh, dollars uh, in gold but then after 1971 nobody could redeem dollars in gold now not coincidentally the price of an ounce of gold at that time was about 35 dollars and uh, today it's uh I think 1600 or 1700 something like that I, I i don't really follow very closely anymore uh but you know it's obviously went up enormously quickly and all throughout the 70s we had an enormous increase in the uh, dollar exchange rate uh to gold as well as the rise of the prices of everything oil copper zinc nickel everything got a lot more expensive in the 1970s and i think this is the driver of the um scarcity mentality this is what this is i think the wind in the sails of all of the environmental hysterics and all of the ideas that we are going to ruin the planet come from the fact that people are shocked at the fact that they can no longer afford things that they could afford a few years ago and they think it must be physical and geographic limits and natural limits rather than just you know their central bank because you don't want to believe the ugly truth <laughs> yeah yeah, you're clearly right. When you look at uh, what happened prior to August 15th, 1971, Sunday morning, you know, what Nixon did was to really create, uh, create a lot of chaos in the world because now you, you don't have this trust in currency that uh, allowed people to really have these long time horizons and, uh, yeah, it's uh, you know how we get a how we get to get that trust back. It's just like the fiat world is upon us. Um, now, what what I would say is that what we observed in our data is yeah, we had this huge price increase, but we also tend to see wages will catch up and exceed those prices over time. So when you first have this new uh, new money that's created, it tends to show up in in people trying to grab the money and put it in something that they hope is going to, to hold its value over time. Uh, so you see these big pushes in commodity and commodities and real estate and, you know, the stock market, for example, it's like, well, you want to just trend line uh, fed expansion. Uh, look at, uh, look at the Dow and see if the comparison is there. Look at real estate. You know, the problem with those two things is all this new money is trying to chase return and purchasing power. Um, 
so you've you've taken people's focus away from creating new capital and creating new wealth to trying to protect it. That has been one of the the huge downsides of this fiat world that we we live in. But we also note that over time wages tend to catch up and exceed those changes in in money prices, which make the time price go down. But people don't see that. They don't think of the time price. They just think of the money price. So they're not doing the comparison against wages. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's a little, little, little difficult because you're seeing all these prices go up, but you realize your wages are probably going to go up as well here over time. Yeah. And I think people are likely to fool themselves into wanting to believe that the reason my wages are going up is just because I'm becoming uh, more productive. And, you know, the, the earth is becoming more scarce, but I am becoming more productive. So it evens out and the central bank is just trying its best <laughs> to help. Uh, that, that, I presume, helps people sleep better at night. But I think, you know, the counterfactual here, and you know, the, the, the really interesting thing for economists is to think about, um, as uh, Bastia calls it, the unseen. The counterfactual here is to go back to that uh, chart of all these uh, prices dropping, you know, the uh, all, all of the uh, commodities decreasing in price. The question then is, well, what would have happened had we stayed on a hard money standard and continued to witness these enormous improvement in productivity? I mean, I think it's probably safe to argue that the prices of things would have dropped by something similar, but obviously not precisely. This isn't uh, chemistry. This isn't physics. We don't have exact equations to predict, but I presume it would have been totally uh, normal that you know the price of sugar would have dropped by something in the range of 86% over those 40 years. The price of rice by 76%, the price of corn by 74%. Um, all these bad examples keeps <laughs> propping up things that I don't like, but coal at 70%, you know, that's, imagine a world in which all of these things continue to drop by this quantity, beef by 67%. In, ter in nominal terms, I think this is much closer to where we would be. I'm not going to pretend that it would be, uh, that, 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 that there's any kind of precise science to how much it would drop. But yeah, about 75% decline in prices would be something to expect from this. Crude oil yeah. down 78%. So here, here's what I think is the reason we like to go to these long periods of analysis is you can you can kind of, you you can see the underlying trend instead of these these short term fluctuations that inflation causes. Uh, one chart that I have go back to 1960. Here's a chart where we go back to 1960 and look at you know this is this was an index that we built. This this was a uh, back to 1960, and we we could only look at 37 commodities. We data uh, gets kind of thin before 1980, but we go back to 1960, we could look at 37 commodities. Look at that trend line of abundance. Red dotted line is just a linear regression on there, but look at the blue line of the actual data, how it was conforming so close to this increase in abundance. And then 1971 happens, and we have this kind of chaos distortion that's occurring with these prices. In other words, you, you've you introduced a lot of, of just kind of this chaos into the, into the market because your currency now has lost its stability. But overall, uh, we tend to continue to have the stability to, to continue to innovate and grow. But a lot of this, and what I tell people is, look, speculators make money on the blue line, investors make money on the red line. Uh, speculators that are playing the short-term market, yeah, you're going to have this fluctuation moving up and down because you've got all of these things happening. But the fundamental trend line, 10, 20, 30 years says, look, we're continuing to, to be able to grow in knowledge. So uh, yeah, something happened in 71 that kind of threw us off of this nice, smooth, you know, consistent growth in and created <laughs> a lot of static is what I would say. You've created a lot of static in the market that kind of distorted our ability to see this underlying trend. And that's why go out and look at 40, 50, 60 years worth of data, and then you'll start seeing these trends. You won't see these short-term uh, shocks, uh, so, to, so to speak, of inflation shocks and you know current market condition shocks, you know, bad weather, 
uh, something that happened that would cause prices to move up and down. Yeah, I like to joke on Twitter often that uh, what happened in 1971 is that correlation stopped being causation. Um, there's uh, there's all <laughs> these things that changed to the worse in 1971 at the same time that money, which is one half of every other tra of every transaction and uh, something that's extremely prevalent and pervasive throughout all of our life, the money got broken in 1971. And then lo and behold, all these other things continue to get broken as well. Um, you see it in um, energy prices, you see it in uh, food prices, you see it in so many different things. And um, <laughs> there's, a, there's an entire cottage industry of uh, people on Twitter, mostly economists who uh, love to just uh, come at you with all of these thought substitutes like, oh, well, correlation is not causation. And as if that's an argument, you know, as if, yeah, well, you know, you put a gun into somebody's head and you pull the trigger and then their brains splatter onto the wall. But, you know, correlation is not causation. It could have been anything. Do you have randomized control trials where you put guns to people's head and you see if they kill them? I mean, unless you do a very large sample of a randomized control trial with people with guns to their head, then you can't really conclude <laughs> whether uh, right. this is done. And, and this is kind of, in my mind, I think a lot of modern education is uh, so intertwined with um, government propaganda, particularly in economics. Well, not just particularly in economics and nutrition as well, probably, and many other fields. And it's so intertwined with economic propaganda that almost uh, it's, you almost think that the point of education is to teach people not to notice the obvious and to come up with all of these substitutes for uh, pretending that these things don't matter. So all of these sophisticated ways of reasoning, oh, well, maybe that's just confirmation bias. You don't like yeah. fiat money and now you're looking for all the statistics of things that are bad and you're finding them. Or maybe things would have been even worse in the 1970s because of random yeah. other reason that I'm just gonna pull out of my uh, behind and uh, <laughs> fiat money saved the day, prevented things from getting much, much worse. Right. But I presume he's <laughs> not asking you to not ask you to justify that or explain it. That's, that's well. Just, here, uh, here's what I would. Here's what I'd also say is, look, we we uh, data is history, the future is theory, and we've got all the data we want. But that's history. You have to move forward into the future with theory, and that means you're going to have to to make some logical conclusions with the limited amount of data that you have about what these relationships are, and then move forward with that theory into the future. And you're never gonna have sufficient data to give you this 100% confidence, but <laughs> how are you gonna live your life? You know, what choices are you gonna make before you, given that you've got a limited number of choices before you? Uh, exactly, and given that, you know, I mean, the whole point of human reason is to try and discern cause and effect. I mean, uh, the, the brain is not an entertainment device in our mind where we just use it to contemplate ideas for, this, for, for the heck of it. The brain is what differentiates us from animals and it's what allows us to have reason. It's what allows us to act rationally. And so you have no choice but to, this is what you do at every second of your life. You think of the options, you try and understand the causal mechanisms, and you try and act in a way that meets your ends. So, you know, you, you, you don't need to perform uh, randomized control trials to figure out whether, you know, you should get out of bed on the side that's next to the wall or right into the wall, or you go out the yeah. other side. You can use your brain and you know <laughs> that if I go that way, it's going to hit the wall. So all of our life, we're trying to reason with the best that we can. And you know, obviously it's not going to always be right, but it's, uh, I think education focuses too much on the examples when reason can be wrong to the point of paralysis, to the point of mental paralysis, right. where people just, uh, you know, in, in economics in particular, in particular when it comes to inflation, so many economists are just so set on problematizing any kind of, any kind of conclusion that they can't accept right. any amount of evidence because you can always problematize things. You know, what if you try yeah. this and what if you try that? But right, it's like that's clever, but is it valuable? You know, your models yeah, and all that stuff. Exactly. And I think back to back to Malthus and Ehrlich both. They were driven on this model. You know, their stuff was models. They were modeling into the future. It's like, you know, if if you don't have data, any theory can be true. If you haven't tested it against reality, any of these theories can be true. So 
do you want to rely on somebody's uh, hypothetical model about what's going to happen into the future with, with respect to climate or whatever? Or do you want to look at this underlying data that you can look at and and draw conclusions out of that and move into the future? Um, we've gotten in a lot of, I think, a lot of trouble relying on these models that, that were never empirically based. Malthus, for example, if he had looked at the price of bread in England uh, for the previous 100 years in population, he would have realized that his theory was not supported by the data. Population in England's going up, but the price of bread is falling. How could that be true if they were running out of resources? I think if he were to, if you were to bring, uh, you know, if he were to appear today in a Walmart, he would immediately reject his, his theory. He would say, my theory was wrong. Uh, the data here demonstrate that, that I'm wrong you know, let, let's hope that we can go forward based on, yeah, we've got to, we've got to have theories, but those theories have to have some basis in reality. And that's the empirical world. What have we done? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's, 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 it's not out of the question that we might have seen a 75% reduction in the price of oil from 1980 until now. So if, if in 1980, we'd, uh, Imagine we'd moved on, or imagine, you know, Paul Volcker, he keeps getting credited as the guy who killed inflation, but imagine he really, truly, genuinely did kill inflation by just saying, you know what, no more dollars getting printed ever. Uh, here's the dollar printer. <laughs> I'm going to throw it at the bottom of the ocean. No one's ever going to be able to make another dollar, and banks need to sort themselves out. There's no more central bank. There's no more monetary policy. The dollar supply at that point, I'm I don't even know, but I'm going to guess it was maybe something like half a trillion dollars, probably $500 billion. Yeah. I'm just random number guess. So imagine we just had those $500 billion and he said, that's it. No more dollars for anybody ever again. And then the whole world economy had to make do with those $500 billion. Obviously, you could run the world economy on $500 billion. You could run it on $500 as long as you keep dividing it into smaller and smaller units. So in that yeah. world, it's, you know, today, I think it, you know, if you take thirty-five dollars and you take it, uh, take seventy-five percent off of that, you end up with a price of eight point seven five dollars. That this would be the price of a barrel of oil today, and I think not many people mention this. I mean, I think we could be living in a world in which a barrel of oil currently it's around eighty dollars. I think the price of a barrel of oil, it right. could it could have been eight dollars. And well, you know, here, here's the thing about it. go back to 1970, look at the price of oil. And then 71, Nixon goes off the gold standard. What happened to the oil price in 73? I mean, the Arabs realized, hey, <laughs> you, uh, you know, the purchasing power of your dollar is collapsing. Uh, we're no longer going to accept the 12, you know, $4 a barrel. We're going to $12 a barrel to get it back in conformity to what the purchasing power of the dollar is. So I'd look to 71 as being a leading cause of the 73 oil crisis. I mean, there are other things happening, but, you know, fundamentally, it was this economic challenge back to the dollar that said, look, we want, we want uh, the purchasing power of a, of a dollar has got to be consistent with our price of oil. We're going to try to re realign those. So how can you blame them? Yeah, and I think, I mean, you know, obviously it's, uh, oil is not a commodity produced by these few governments. Uh, if, if they just decided tomorrow that they wanted $800 oil, they're not going to get it. They won't be able to sell their oil for 800 and others will undercut them, but the price is going to have to end up where the market finds it, where, where supply and demand meet. But yeah, actually, that's a much better point that you make, which is we shouldn't take that from 1980. Imagine we go to 1970, and at that point, the price of a barrel of oil was $3. And then you add in 50 years of economic growth, and let's say it's only 75% reduction. So yeah, we go from $3 to a quarter dollar right now, maybe, or half a dollar. This would be the price of a barrel of oil today. This is, I think, where the world would have been if instead of removing uh, the gold exchange window, Nixon had really gone back to a proper gold standard. Sure, it would have hurt for the next couple of years. He wouldn't have gotten reelected. Things would have been pretty bad uh, politically for him. Uh, it's, it, it, was it would have been political suicide in the short run. But I mean, think about how much better it would have been in the long run. 50 years later, people today would be paying $2 or, uh, sorry, a quarter dollar for a barrel of oil, a nickel for a barrel of oil. Obviously, wages would be lower, 
um, you know, you wouldn't be getting paid uh, $15 an hour to work at McDonald's. You'd be getting paid a lot less, but still. Um, right. It's the relative prices. It's what, what are the price of things versus your wages? What is the time price? What would it be, yeah. be doing? And I mean, one of the one of the ideas of a time price is can we go to something, you know, moving from money to time says, you know, time really has these five advantages over money. One, a time price allows you innovation shows up both in higher incomes and lower prices. So you're capturing innovation from both of those things. The second thing a time price does is you can avoid all this contention with trying to get GDP deflators and CPI indexes and all this subjectivity and contention. The third advantage of a time price is that you can go anywhere in any time with any currency and figure out what the time price was. I can go back to Beirut in 1800 and figure out what the time price was of a loaf of bread. And I can compare it to what the time price is today. Um, the, the fourth reason is time is this universal standard that everybody recognizes. It's, it's both fixed and continuous. And then the fifth uh, reason time is better is because we have this sense of equality under time. We all get 24 hours a day. So if we move from thinking and in income inequality to time inequality, we get a completely different picture. So, so back to can we move to something that is is fixed and continuous to start measuring things against instead of this fiat rubber ruler that uh, you know fiat currencies are. That's where we've got to try to sort through all of this static and go to some fundamental unit that's a scientific unit of the seven measurements that we use in science. Six of them are based in time. Economics needs to be based in time, not money. It needs to be based in knowledge, not atoms. I agree. I agree. And I think uh, a key difference here is that, so I was, as I was mentioning in terms of the $3 uh, barrel of oil back then, you know, the average family in the US uh, that had an income of about $10,000 in 1970. It's obviously much higher now. It would have likely gone down a bit probably over time, maybe gone up a bit, but I think prices would have gone down a lot more. But the interesting thing with where the dynamic really changes is that uh, your grandfather's pocket change in 1970 would be serious money today, which means your grandfather would have had a very serious, a very different set of incentives throughout the 1970s and 80s, and your parents from the 80s and 90s and so on until today. So that you know, people born in 1990 or people born in the year 2000 would be in a very different place because we, you know their their parents and grandparents only need to put aside pocket change and watch it appreciate over time and watch its purchasing power increase so that then they would be able to pass on to their children something that is significant for them. Right. When you think of what fiat uh, uh, inflation has done is it's taken these resources from this private sector to the public se sector to pursue all these all of these projects and programs. I mean, you think about inflation and it's this primary thing that's associated with war. Governments engage in war because they can inflate in the short run. And uh, being able to say, no, we've got to stick to these gold standards. It, in my mind, it says you cannot engage in war uh, thinking that you can get through this experience by inflating, uh, through, uh, you know, inflating through your aggression. You can't do that under a standard where it's, it's, it's not a fiat deal. So it really allowed governments to pursue much more aggressive war activity with, with fiat. And uh, so another damaging thing to, to us as human beings. So I find there's a fascinating uh, switch and bait that happened here. I think also within, and I think it can also be explained with inflation, which is in the 1970s, we were going to run out of everything. And that's why we were all going to die. And that coincided with the fact that prices went up massively. So the price of oil went up at 10x during that period between 1971 and 1980, from about $3 to $30. The price of gold went up something like... Um, 20x from $30 an ounce to $800 or $700 an ounce. Yeah. With during that time, it was we're all going to die because we're all running out of things. We're, we've we've squeezed the earth dry. We've squeezed every last drop of resources, and now it's all going to be famines. And that's the Paul Ehrlich line. But then in the 1980s, 
we see at the time, you know, inflation relatively subsides. It's uh, things are much better. We didn't get another 10x in oil prices between 1980 and 1990. Um, the price of oil was relatively flat between 80 and 90. In fact, up until 2000, it generally hovered around the region of, you know, 30, 20 to 40, 50, 60, something like that. Uh, no, nowhere near as drastic as the 10 years before. And I think, you know, the price of gold was stable relatively in the kind of um, 200 to 600 maybe range. So there wasn't that much inflation, but the doom saying continued. And there was a very interesting pivot in the, the uh, doom where it's no longer that we've run the earth dry. We're not running the earth dry. There's so much of everything, but there is so much of it that we're going to ruin the earth by consuming so much of it. And uh, that's driven all of this kind of environmental hysteria, which you see that is more prevalent today, which is all about we are consuming so much and that's going to destroy the earth. Do you think that's also... Yeah, you had this publication of Limits to Growth. The Club of Rome did this, Limits to Growth. Uh, I think that was 72 or 73 when they came out and, and they said they made the Malthusian argument. Hey, we're going to run out of stuff. And 20 years later, they said, well, it doesn't look like we're going to run out of the stuff, but in in the process of consuming all this stuff, we're going to create all this pollution and pollution is going to kill us. Well, you know, 10, 15 years later, it's like all this, all these pollution factors all had collapsed. The most recent iteration of limits to growth is that they've redefined pollution to be CO2. So now their model says, you're going to, we're going to blow ourselves up because population increases, CO2 is going to do this, and we're going to have this we're going to have this collapse. So it's like you keep redefining the model to be able to be some other new cause. At what point do we say, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe your model's wrong. <laughs> you know, maybe, you know, you, you say you want to predict something, but look, science is about predicting a number and a date. It's, it's going to be both of them. What's going to happen on that date? And you don't seem to be able to have been able to do that. No, so, not at all. Yeah, I think that I, it's interesting your argument that inflation leads people to believe that there's scarcity. So it's almost like this inflation-induced emotional perception of scarcity when in fact the underlying data says no, we're not having we're not having scarcity. What we're having is inflation. And it's different. It's different. And our our data says no. <laughs> Time prices say you weren't, you're not having scarcity, you're having inflation. Yeah, I think I, I think that's that's kind of a, a very central argument in uh, in the fiat standard and also in the principles of economics. And in the fiat standard, I think it's uh, it, you see this reflected in food, you see this reflected in energy. I think the rise of modern nutrition science can't be extricated from the fact that governments are trying to hide the fact that food's becoming more expensive because this is a very unpopular thing. I mean, people go to the grocery store and they get pissed off because they can't buy the same things that they were able to buy last month. And then there's an election and they go and they vote uh, and, and they make their feelings heard. And so if you're in power, you have a vested interest in trying to tell people to eat cheap food. And I think this has been a very strong uh, driver of uh, modern uh, nutrition science. And I think also it's true in case of energy, because even though we moved away from the, all right, we're going to run out of all oil and gas and coal, and we're going to run the earth dry, we still have to reduce the consumption of it. So, all right, we're not running out of it, but we still need you to stop it. You know, the thing that those two things have in common, there's too little oil or too much oil, both of them have one thing in common, which is that you need to consume less oil and you need to go back to using windmill technology like your seventh century ancestors who relied on the wind blowing in order to try and get any work done. And um, because the wind is uh, less susceptible to inflation. And I think, um, you know, it's, this is the double whammy of inflation because on the one hand, it takes away your ability to buy meat and uh, oil. And then on the other hand, it gives government the ability to finance uh, people to get on TV and to get to your university and explain to you why actually meat and oil are bad for you and have some industrial uh, waste and uh, some windmills instead because 
you know, the science says these things are much better for you <laughs> and for Earth. Because yeah. you know, we need you to serve the Earth. It's it's not about us getting reelected when we are pillaging you. It's just about saving the Earth. We're just uh, so uh, good and so benevolent that we want to save the Earth for your grandchildren by robbing you and uh, feeding you <laughs> industrial waste. Right. It, it's like all of these theories, uh, pollution, resources, they all come down to this idea that there are too many people. And, uh, you know, we could solve all of our problems if there were fewer people. Well, I think what, what we found and what Julian Simon would say is, look, the way you solve problems is with more people, not fewer people. It's more people that you need with their ideas and their ingenuity and their imaginations. They're going to solve these. Well, not necessarily solve the problems. We live in this world of trade-offs, but they're going to create different choices that are going to give us more and more valuable ways of using our time and uh, and the resources that we do have. So it's this trust that we've got to place in individual human uh, freedom to innovate that really is going to guide us forward into the future. And, and this pushback from governments and so forth that, no, we can't do that is, it's like, well, on what basis do you make this argument? What other than this hypothetical theory from a model, you have nothing empirical to support your argument. So we we become this model-obsessed world versus an empirical verification world. We've got to go back to testing what really has happened against what your models are suggesting is going to happen. And is there <laughs> is there a reason to to maybe have less confidence in these models that you are? you're using to uh, to uh, argue for policy i think there are many good reasons uh one more one more tidbit which i i have not included in principles of economics yet but i might add it uh somebody wrote this article of what is the volume of humanity and i think that's a very powerful uh, uh, further illustration of the issue so in, in the mind of the average person everybody thinks you know we are just such a massive burden on earth but in fact if you put all of humanity together in one cube we would all fit into this one cube that you see here that has sides of 770 meters uh, this was uh, 2018 four years ago we've probably grown a little bit bigger since then so maybe 800 meters so basically 800 meters cube and as you see it here next to the golden gate bridge in san francisco um basically it would fit it would fit in between the uh, two sides of the uh, golden gate bridge all of humanity if you melted us all down this is our volume i think this is a very useful perspective to keep in mind when people tell you there's too many humans on earth and all all of us we could be melted down into 0.47 cubic kilometers this is nothing it's it's it's, it's extremely tiny and so it's uh, it's it, it, the idea that we are too crowded on this earth is ridiculous. And I think um, I don't have uh, the source for this one particular stat at this point, but uh, I've heard something along the lines that if all of humanity were to live like your average American suburban house, you could fit all of humanity in Texas. Everybody, so all 8 billion of us could have our suburban home and um, backyard and dog uh, house. In Texas. And I always remember, yeah, I always remember that some people think that that's not dense enough. I mean, why why do people want to dance up in urban areas? You know, if, yeah. if having space is important to you, why do people choose to not have space? The reason they do that is because being close to another person, being close to other people will make you richer, healthier, and live longer. Uh, that's why we have urban centers where we can enjoy one another's association and grow knowledge much faster when we're closer physically together. And people that have choices tend to want to prefer to be in cities next to one another than being out in South Dakota. Yeah. In fact, I think it was in 2007 that humanity became predominantly urban. Uh, half of humanity was uh, living in cities. And I think now that's exceeded uh, that number. And obviously cities keep getting bigger because our transportation mechanisms get bigger. But yeah, the reason people want to get into cities is because of other people. And, and <laughs> this is always my answer to people who tell you, well, the earth is too crowded, there's too many people or humans are ruining earth or uh, 
uh, noise pollution and the light pollution are a serious issue and the cities are a plague. All of these people say that in the city and all of those people say that with the technologies that are afforded to us by the city. And so I, my question is always to them is the vast majority of Earth is completely unimpacted by human beings. Just go to, to the national parks in the U.S. or go to, uh, and I mean, they're enormous areas. So people think Yellowstone National Park, they think it's a park like Central Park. Where you, you know, they go, yeah. there's an entrance and an exit, but yeah. it's... It's bigger than not Central Park, not Manhattan, not New York City. It's bigger than New York State, uh, if I recall correctly. It's, it's an enormous area. So you could fit hundreds of millions of people into uh, Yellowstone National Park comfortably. And yet you don't have anybody living there practically. And yet you could just go and camp out there and you know make sure you don't take camping equipment that's made by civilization. But if civilization is such a pain, for you, I don't see you out there. I see all of those people getting online, um, <laughs> places that are connected to the internet, connected to the grid, where they can access their modern laptops, and then explaining to you how actually we need to get rid of all of this infrastructure that makes this possible. But that's why people come to cities. That's why your actions speak much louder than words, because in a city, you're able to deal with a market of millions of people. That means Everything that you can that you can produce can be bought by millions of people, and everything that you want to buy, you have a choice between the products of millions of people. And most importantly, perhaps you can specialize so much in the production of something, and in in, in a tiny little part of the production process. Like the most productive people, the highest paid people are the people who are uh, who have the most intricate and specialized jobs, you know, like an engineer at a software company or at a hardware company or at a car company, you know, they spend 30 years working on one tiny little aspect of car making and their skills are completely useless outside of an economy where they can sell this car to markets of billions of people. If you put them in an economy of 10,000 yeah. people, they're completely useless. They can't do right. anything that's useful. They can't just make a smaller car or a slower car for the 10,000 people. They need to have this enormous division of labor. You know, back to your uh, thought about urban versus rural areas. You know, today has been really the only time in history where people can choose between those two things. And the reason you can choose to go live in Montana is because of the innovation of people who live in highly dense cities that have knowledge networks, you get to choose if you want to be in a place like that or not today. Uh, 300 years ago, that wasn't a choice available to people, you know, to suggest that we have, you know, we have too many people. The reason that we are so wealthy and you get the choices you have today is because of that population density. It gives us Absolutely. more choices, not fewer choices. More people give us more choices. Absolutely. Very much so. Very much so. All right. Let's, oh, we've gone on for a, quite a while now. Let's open it up. There's one more question I wanted to ask you about Bitcoin. What do you think of Bitcoin? I know you've read my book, so <laughs> clearly you must have uh, some thoughts. I've read your, I've read your book many a times. Uh, you know, it's one of the most highlighted books. I, I think it has more highlight in it than white, actually. You know, here's the issue is, look, I have great faith in the blockchain. What I don't know yet is where is Bitcoin going to be able to go forward? Uh, you know, typically it's always been, and this is Gilder's argument. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm a neophyte on Bitcoin, but the issue has always been, can you control the quantity or the value? Uh, can you control both of those? If you control quantity, then value is flexible. If you control value, then you've got to adjust the quantity. Is Bitcoin going to be able to go forward and really create this fixed quantity that then allows people to have this trust and faith in its value? Is it going to continue to have this, this growth or not? So we're just going to have to see if this thing, uh, you know, we're going to have to let the market and people learn about how this technology can create trust between people, because fundamentally, it's a unit of trust. Can we trust Bitcoin to carry purchasing power forward into the future? Let's hope that, you know, the blockchain is going to help us to solve that, or, you know, the blockchain is going to help us to create the environment that allows us to have more trust between each other 
with respect to trying to to trade the present for the future this idea of money so you know I, once again i i i blockchain i um, i just don't know yeah i mean i think in in my principles of economics textbook i um I'm writing the final chapters, uh, chapter or two chapters. I'm not sure if I'm going to split it into two or keep it as one because it's uh, getting very long. And so I, in the book, I go through the main economic concepts, you know, starting with time and uh, Julian Simon's ideas and scarcity and then, um, you know, capital and labor and uh, the division of labor, trade, money. And then how civilization and how the market system emerges from that. Then, you know, when all of the good stuff is uh, explained, then we move to the bad stuff, the dark side, which is um, human violence and coercion, the opposite of markets and destruction, and how that thing is real and it exists. And bad things are always happening. Every day there are bad things happening somewhere in the world. How essentially, I think the argument, I, having written the fiat standard, having looked at the world and how it has changed throughout my life, I think there's a serious case to be made that the world is getting worse in a certain sense. So yes, you're right. Things are getting more abundant. We do have more of uh, all of these things in terms of our time. But the world is getting worse in the fact that, uh, in my opinion, uh, politics and inflation are making life more difficult for people in extremely inconvenient ways. And I'd always had the belief that technology was improving. And I think most economists have to share this belief that technology is improving life and that the bad things are being slowly eliminated because of technological progress. But I think understanding how fiat money works is making me revise that because I think fiat money is not just inflation. It's not just theft. It's much more pernicious than that. It's not just that you're taking away five or 10 or 15% of somebody's money every year. You're undoing the glue that holds civilization together like it's 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 right. really un, uh, unscrewing all the screws of this enormous magnificent machine that we built as a human race over thousands of years you're taking out the screws one by one and taking out all these essential screws and essentially selling them uh, today to finance your drug habit <laughs> this is this is how you can think of uh, inflation really because I mean, look look at hyperinflation, and and I was in Lebanon when, uh, and and you see Lebanon and, and the hyperinflationary situation. You you see, it's not just that people lost their money in a bank account. That's obviously tragic, and it's obviously very bad. But even worse than that, you know, it's not like the money was just lost. It's that entire businesses cannot function. Entire ideas on on the market disappear. The ability of a business that's been around for sixty years to maintain itself is gone. A family business, a large business that employs hundreds of people. It can't operate anymore because there's no longer functioning money. So if you robbed everybody that was in that business, uh, you know, you put them at gunpoint and you took all their money, and then the next morning they woke up and the currency was still working and the banking system was still working, well, they re can rebuild. But when you've destroyed the currency, they can no longer function. And I think all the world is essentially hyperinflation on slow motion. We're witnessing this happening in slow motion. And I think the last couple of years, are a very, very big wake-up call for people to think about just how bad the world is becoming because of fiat money. You know, the fact that governments can just shut down the world, ruin billions of people's livelihood and lock them at home because, you know, um, some ridiculous epidemiology right. studio science. And the fact that uh, so many lives can be ruined, the fact that so many businesses could go out of business, all of that is extremely, extremely dangerous. And all of that, in my opinion, is driven by uh, fiat money, by the two processes of, as I mentioned earlier in the fiat standard, you know, they, they're they devaluing your money, taking away your wealth, taking away your ability to finance yourself. And on the other hand, financing themselves and uh, being able to produce all this propaganda to get you to um, believe in this stuff. And I don't think this is something that technology on its own, in a sense of business as usual, can get around. A lot of economists um, will have this kind of idea that, oh, well, you know, if the central bank is doing such a bad job, well, why don't entrepreneurs just figure out a way around it? And I think, you know, some, some of the kind of George Mason economists will mention something like this, like, uh, okay, so what if it is like, this is their kind of magnificent critique of the Austrian business cycle theory and the root of inflation is that, 
well, if the central bank is doing so such a terrible job with the currency, why can't entrepreneurs factor that into their calculations and get around it? And of course, the answer is you can't because there's a monopoly. You can't just run a, an alternative banking system. You can't run an alternative currency. You know, go try and introduce an alternative to the dollar and an alternative to the banking system and see how far you get. And uh, you know, uh, people have tried to introduce that in a centralized way. Obviously, they didn't get very far. You can't just open a bank without a license from the Federal Reserve, and then the Federal Reserve is has a monopoly on the currency. But really, I think Bitcoin is such a big deal because it is the way that entrepreneurs have gone around it. And it's back to our discussion of why ideas and technology are so powerful. It's because they're non-rival. This is, I mean, it's, it's like a cat and mouse game. And this is, uh, the, the cat has almost uh, cornered the mouse and left it with no options. And then the mouse had to go to the digital realm and Bitcoin is just this incredible, incredible idea that is not physical, that is to a certain degree unstoppable, perhaps. And it changes everything because it is the alternative. It is the entrepreneur's way. It is the creative way to get around all of those things, to provide people with an alternative so that as the destruction of the current monetary system continues to unfold, anybody who wakes up to it is able to realize that they do have an alternative. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think back to this fundamental issue is civilizations are built on trust. And money is a unit of trust. And, and inflation doesn't just destroy money, it destroys trust. And, you know, we always thought, I mean, you go back to Friedman, he says, well, we want to have these floating currencies. And, and we hope that these countries will compete with one another to, to maintain the value of their currencies. And that competition will make these currencies trustworthy. Well, uh, as long as uh, those guys don't collude with one another. <laughs> Maybe that works, but you really have this collusion now around the planet of these central banks all inflating together, uh, you know, getting these short-term gains of this inflation that that is really destroying not only the money, it's destroying trust between one another. So being able to create an alternative to that, something that gives us a, a thing that we can trust in that's not a function of of who's in office or the policy, it's based on math, it's based on time, then I think we can begin to say, this is truly, can you trust in time? Would you prefer to trust in time or trust in money? Let's trust in time somehow. And Bitcoin is really trying to say, can we, can we, can we fix the quantity here as this function of time that allows us to, to create distrust between each other? Now it's, you know, it's up to human beings to decide if they're going to give that an opportunity to now be worthy of their trust. But it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say two things to that. First of all, it's, <laughs> Bitcoin's not really optional. It's not up to human beings to decide. That basically, the choice that's um, available to most people is um, Bitcoin now or Bitcoin later. I think there's a case to be made that this is the case <laughs> because... Yeah. Um, you know, you could choose, you could choose, all right, I don't want it, but it's not like, you know, all right, I don't want the iPhone, I want to stick to Android, or I don't want to use a cell phone, and I want to use a regular phone, or I don't want to, you know, join Twitter, I'm going to stick to Facebook. It's a little bit different from this, because this is such an enormously powerful economic tool, that you're not going to be in the same universe with the people who are using it if you continue to reject it. In other words, if you continue to use, and you know, you look at an example of a place like Lebanon, you know, the people who managed to um, get out of the local fiat uh, system into Bitcoin are living in a completely different situation than people who stayed in the fiat system. And so eventually, I think that's a microcosm of what's going to be reflected in the long run. And then eventually, you don't, here we are, you know, the, the, the problems have been going on in Lebanon now for more than three years. And there was a good article about it in NBC um, just this week, uh, and a good piece done uh, by McKinsey Segalos, a journalist, a Bitcoin journalist. And you see there's a basically small but growing economy of people in Lebanon that are able to trade with the rest of the world, work with the rest of the world, have savings, and um, maintain their economic well-being through using Bitcoin. You know, it's, and I think um, that's, uh, that's the kind of real choice. At the end of the day, 
uh, most people who are kind of dismissive of Bitcoin seem to be thinking of it as if, you know, it's just another app on your phone. You know, are you going to download this messenger app or that messenger app? Well, you don't download this messenger app. You can download another. Or you don't download Candy Crush. You can download Angry Birds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not like yeah. that. It's it's a difference between life and death, quite literally, for many people, because there is no other alternative. There's no other way of providing something that governments can't control, that governments can't inflate, and that governments can't use uh, to finance themselves. So, because of that, I think it's um, it's it's almost an, an an insurmountable technological force because it has such a powerful amount of economic incentive behind it. And it rewards people who use it, and it punishes people who don't use it. In a sense, you know, if, if, if this is why I always say, like, if if uh, Bitcoin needed me to evangelize for it, I wouldn't be interested. And the reason I evangelize, the reason I talk about Bitcoin, is basically because it's a job. It's because people like my book, and I've found that I'm good at explaining those things. It's a job for me to be able to feed my family. I don't. If Bitcoin depended on my activism and my evangelism, it would, I think, uh, I'd give up on it. And the second thing is, uh, there's a great article that I'll send to you by um, one uh, an anonymous Bitcoiner who's been on the show before. His, um, he goes by uh, Gigi. And he's written a book, an article called Bitcoin in His Time. And it's also part of his uh, book. He's also written a book called uh, 21 Lessons, Bitcoin and 21 okay. Lessons. And he makes the argument for why Bitcoin really is time. I I don't think I'm going to be able to do his argument justice now because it's it's extremely sophisticated. But essentially, what Bitcoin does is time stamping. Bitcoin is a way for the world to have a time telling device that is independent of any authority. We've min- managed to build a time machine in a sense because it's a machine that um, arrives at time stamping blocks and transactions without having to rely on a single authority, which is an enormously powerful invention because it allows us to keep accurate track records, to know who owes what, uh, who owns what, and to not mess with uh, the records. And of course, then it's the other aspect of it is that it's, uh, it, it is also like time in the sense that it is truly scarce. I think this is a truly remarkable thing, you know, and I write this in the Bitcoin standard, which is that before, you know, if you, before Bitcoin, Julian Simon was right. Everything was abundant. We could make more of everything with our time. If we dedicate more of our time towards mining nickel, we get more nickel. If you want more copper, we get more copper. The only limit on how much copper or nickel or oil we have is just how much time we dedicate to it. Well, Bitcoin breaks that mold. Bitcoin is the first thing that the first exception to Julian Simon's rule because it's the one thing that, no matter how much time we dedicate to making it, we can't make more of it. So that's well, I'm going to read those papers. <laughs> yeah, I'll send because <laughs> I'm to trying you. to make, I'm trying to make the connection between time and Bitcoin, and it's like, okay, how do we put these two together in a way that's coherent that people will go, yes, that makes that makes sense, and now I can trust I can trust this because it is tied to this universal standard of time. Yeah. And I think the, the key thing is that you don't have to trust this because you can verify it yourself. You can download the software code on your program, uh, on your computer. You can get the program on your computer and you can see every single transaction in the history of Bitcoin. And that, that's essentially what the Bitcoin software does. There's 21 million Bitcoin out there. Uh, 19.3, I think, have been produced so far. And then another 1.7 are still to be produced over the next century or so. And what your software does is just it keeps track of all of those coins amongst all of these Bitcoin addresses. And so it, every 10 minutes, it updates the allocation of those coins based on the transaction. So this address sent that many coins to that address. And then everybody updates that ledger. And then all of those, coin, all of those nodes, all those members of the network worldwide agree every single 10 minutes that, yep, this is the new state of the ledger. And the way they do that is because of uh, their ability to arrive at time, uh, uh, time sequencing in a distributed manner. I think you're going to love this article. Decentralized consensus, which yes. you know, eliminates the monopoly issue. And it also, I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. We, we just have to be able to help people understand it's like moving from Roman numerals to Arabic numerals. It's, you know, once you realize what you can do with it, it makes much more sense. 
That's true. And there's another article by um, specifically about this by um, Robert Breedlove, and he says the article is called "Bitcoin oh, okay. is uh, uh, Zero, I think, or the invention of zero, or Bitcoin is the re- something along Bitcoin is like the zero, in that okay. uh, the addition of zero just completely revolutionized mathematics, and I think the uh, invention of Bitcoin revolutionizes money and uh, time. Yeah. Okay, well, Dr. Puli, thank you so much for joining us. This has been an absolute pleasure. I enjoyed this discussion so much. Yeah, well, uh, thank you again. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's do this again. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Please do keep in touch and uh, keep us posted with all your work and with all of the progress on the Simon Index. Let's just keep bringing these right. numbers down. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds great. All right, take care. Bye-bye.